Thank you. I, I'd like to thank uh, Drs. Allen and Furman uh, for asking me uh, to this meeting again, and especially Dr. Coleman, uh, driving force <coughs> behind uh, what I think is a really unique educational meeting. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot uh, in the last several years that I've attended, and I hope that uh, you have as well. So my task is to uh, speak on the topic of anaticlax. You've heard a bit about this drug earlier uh, today, and I'll talk in a bit more detail. Uh, really uh, try to focus on some practical issues of using the drug. I suspect uh, uh, there's less experience with this drug than with the BTK inhibitors, for example, but it's clearly uh, an important drug for our patients. Uh, when should we consider using it? Well, let's look at <clears throat> what clinical trials results uh, inform our uh, decisions. So um, just as a bit of background, we uh, know that uh, both ibrutinib and idalilisib uh, have uh, high uh, response rates and survival rates in CLL patients at uh, all stages of disease, but those whose disease is refractory or uh, who relapse after uh, therapy or those who are intolerant of uh, these agents may have poor outcomes. Uh, venetoclax uh, was a, a rationally designed molecule to inhibit BCL2. BCL2 overexpression in CLL uh, has long been known, uh, and it's an attractive target because that overexpression inhibits uh, normal apoptosis. So from a very simplistic viewpoint, uh, what uh, this drug does is it uh, binds a pro-apoptotic Oh, well, excuse me, BCL2 binds proaptotic proteins, and uh, venetoclax uh, interrupts that binding, therefore restores normal mitochondrial apoptosis. So it allows the cells to die the way they normally should through the process of apoptosis. So the uh, uh, results of really the, the earliest studies uh, were published in the New England Journal uh, last uh, year. Uh, from the group here, led by uh, Dr. Roberts. <clears throat> uh, these sort of summarize the results. On the left-hand panel, uh, you can see at the top the dosing schedules, uh, where you, uh, the, the study was a typical dose escalation study looking for an MTD. Uh, plasma levels were dose dependent, not surprisingly, and the bottom curve show uh, uh, on the left, the, the nodal mass, so the reduction in uh, lymph nodes with dosing, and the colors represent the different doses of uh, venetoclax from 150 milligrams all the way up to uh, 1,200 milligrams in a few patients. Uh, but the important observation from the early experience was the observation of tumor lysis syndrome. So a double-edged sword, really, uh, shows that a drug is very efficacious, but uh, clearly a, a safety signal. Uh, so the trial was uh, reset, uh, and the dosing schedule shown on the upper right-hand panel was used. I'll show that in a little more detail uh, in a subsequent slide. Really starting at a low dose, carefully monitoring patients up to the target dose of 400 milligrams. Uh, the absolute lymphocyte count shown in the middle right panel uh, was dramatically reduced in virtually every patient. Uh, and there was also very impressive results in the bone marrow in these heavily pretreated patients. So very active drug. So the results of that study uh, informed what became the pivotal registration study, the study uh, shown here, led by Dr. Stilgenbauer. Uh, from uh, Germany, and this was in high-risk deletion 17P patients, uh, relapse patients. So sort of the worst of the worst group of CLL patients um, that we deal with in clinical practice. And uh, the dosing schedule adopted for this and subsequent uh, studies and what's now FDA approved is shown here. So we start with a low dose, 20 milligrams, and very, very, very carefully monitor patients for tumor lysis. So all patients get prehydrated, all patients get allopurinol or um, a similar uh, drug, uh, and then are given a dose of drug. Uh, their electrolytes are measured an hour later, they're measured several hours later, uh, and they cannot be dosed with the uh, second dose of the drug the following morning until all those values are completely normal. Uh, and that was done each week of the dosing schedule, 
to 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams, and then the 400 milligram test dose. So we were uh, hospitalizing patients for several days, all patients, uh, for this dose uh, ramp up. And what we learned uh, is <clears throat> that this schedule uh, was safe uh, and not only effective, but also safe, and we did not see significant clinical tumor lysis. But again, very, very rigorous monitoring in this early experience. So uh, uh, here you can see the characteristics of the patients in this uh, study, very heavily pretreated. Um, half the patients had bulky adenopathy greater than five sonometers. Uh, most of the patients, not surprisingly, 80% were IGHV unmutated, and half the patients had advanced rise stage disease, uh, indicating anemia, thrombocytopenia. So we could categorize patients according to their, their risk of tumor lysis. We define low risk as those with a lymphocyte count less than 25,000 and no lymph node greater than five centimeters. A high risk, uh, anyone who had uh, a lymph node of at least 10 centimeters or of those with uh, greater than five centimeters, less than 10 centimeters, and greater than 25,000 lymphocytes. So think of your patients who uh, have heavily pretreated refractory disease, and certainly many of them would likely fall at least in the intermediate or high risk groups. <clears throat> and here's the results in terms of the lymphocyte count. So each of the vertical bars represents an individual patient. The black circles is where their lymphocyte count was at the start. Several patients had a lymphocyte count in excess of 400,000. And then the open circles at the bottom is where their lymphocyte count ended up. So two patients did not uh, really respond that well. Uh, two other patients almost made uh, a normal lymphocyte count. And every other patient of the 87 normalized their lymphocyte count. Uh, and it happened very rapidly. The median time to response was three weeks. Uh, so really dramatic uh, reduction uh, in circulating uh, tumor cells. When you look at the lymph node responses, uh, and this is looking at their, their largest uh, lymph node in terms of reduction in size, again, vertical bars are individual patients. Uh, and once again, you could see uh, there's a significant response in the majority of patients. So. Uh, 89 of these 96 patients had at least a 50% reduction in their uh, nodal size. And again, response was rapid. Uh, median time was almost uh, three months. But just like uh, treating a patient with abrutinib or idalisib, you, you usually see a, a clinical result. Patients with uh, obvious peripheral adenopathy, uh, you see the lymph nodes shrinking very, very rapidly. One issue that is perhaps a bit more prevalent with this drug than with the uh, B cell receptor pathway inhibitors is neutropenia. I think it is a bit more neutropenic uh, than uh, those other drugs. And so we saw grade three or four neutropenia in 40% of the patients. Of course, some patients had baseline neutropenia from their, their disease. Uh, not surprisingly, infections in the majority of patients, again, a heavily pretreated patient population. Uh, in laboratory tumor lysis in five patients, uh, but uh, no clinical tumor lysis events with this very careful uh, dosing schedule and, and monitoring. Uh, the most uh, common uh, serious adverse events were uh, fever, uh, pneumonia, autoimmune uh, hemolytic anemia. Uh, and although 40% of patients had significant neutropenia, there were only 5% uh, incidence of febrile neutropenia. So uh, as a result, largely of that study and the earlier experience, the FDA approved uh, venetoclax uh, for relapse deletion 17 PCLL, and that remains its uh, uh, only FDA approval at present. So uh, uh, we have follow-up, uh, longer-term follow-up from this study, and that was presented uh, at EHA this past summer. Uh, here's the dosing schedule I showed you previously. Based on that early experience and the safety information we, we gathered, uh, the trials were amended in that we did not have to hospitalize patients if they were in the low risk group. Uh, for intermediate risk group, it was at um, uh, largely the investigator's discretion. We did hospitalize for the dose ramp up all uh, high risk patients. Uh, 
And uh, here's the uh, follow-up of the study. This is, includes 158 patients now. Uh, half the patients were still active on study, half had come off. And you could see that the reasons for discontinuing, about half of the patients who stopped, stopped because of CLL progression. Uh, one out of five in the group as a whole uh, progressed on treatment. 13% uh, had a Richter's transformation, again, generally in uh, an early event, uh, as you've heard uh, from prior speakers with other drugs, adverse events uh, in 10% of the patients. Neutropenia, again, common, a very similar, 40% across the whole uh, cohort. Uh, and in the entire cohort, only 5%, eight patients, uh, had <coughs> uh, laboratory tumor lysis, no clinical tumor lysis, and all patients were able to escalate up to the, uh, the target 400 milligram dose. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, uh, patients with lower intermediate risk for tumor lysis syndrome were able to be treated uh, as an outpatient. Uh, responses were, were rapid, uh, median time to first response in a month, uh, median time to a complete response uh, longer, about uh, 10 months. And you, here you can see the overall response rate in all patients of 77%. There were a handful of patients allowed later in the trial who were previously untreated, five patients. Also very good response rates, uh, a bit higher CR, but small numbers. Uh, and also uh, 18 patients who had previously received either idelalisib or ibrutinib or uh, similar targeted therapies, and again, a very respectable response rate in that uh, group of interest. So with increasing use of abrutinib and idelalisib in targeted therapies and the recognition that some patients, uh, particularly uh, those with high risk genetic features, those heavily pretreated, uh, that there, was a patient, there were patients who progressed. Uh, there was a recognition of a need for alternative therapy, and so uh, this trial was started, a trial using venetoclax for patients who had uh, previously received ibrutinib or idelalisib uh, and had relapsed after therapy or had become refractory to therapy. <clears throat> so this is data uh, presented uh, at ASH of last year. We have... Um, Longer follow-up, uh, an additional year of follow-up uh, that has been analyzed as well, and that'll be reported in uh, two uh, separate manuscripts that hopefully will uh, be published fairly soon. So here's the two arms. The first arm is patients who had previously had ibrutinib as the regimen just prior to receiving venetoclax, and arm B on the right are those who had idelalisib as their last prior regimen. Again, uh, uh, high-risk patients, uh, many prior regimens. There were a couple patients in each group that actually had received only a, a targeted therapy as their only prior therapy, but most had run through the gamut of uh, many different chemoimmunotherapy regimens. Uh, uh, deletion 17P in the abrutinib arm, uh, half the patients, so again, the, the bad actors. And we also had a group of patients who had received both uh, Idella and Ibrutinib. Uh, so uh, we uh, included those patients in the trial as well. More patients, I think, uh, had came on to trial having received Idelalisib as their last prior regimen who had stopped because of intolerance with the Ibrutinib arm. Uh, most patients came on this trial because they were no longer responding or had progressed on ibrutinib. <clears throat> so here you can see the overall response rate, about two-thirds of patients, as similar in both arms when you look at overall response rates, when you look at uh, median uh, or 12-month progression-free survival or 12-month overall survival uh, with longer follow-up. They're very similar between uh, the two arms, whether someone had received a brutinib or idelalisib as their last prior regimen. And looking at the, uh, the myelosuppression, uh, in this trial, we had 60% uh, of patients who had any degree of neutropenia uh, 45% uh, 
with grade three or four, so very similar to the prior trial. Uh, but again, uh, the minority, in this case only 9%, had febrile neutropenia. So it's something that you can often see, particularly when you're starting the treatment, you're starting to see efficacy, you, you can see neutropenia, uh, and uh, you have to recognize that. But as you continue treatment, uh, if you're getting effective management of the CLL, uh, you do see improvement in uh, a normal hematopoiesis. You see the neutropenia uh, resolve. It's not something that continues as a continuing side effect of the, of the drug. And again, no clinical tumor lysis syndrome observed. One patient had laboratory tumor lysis. So we were able to safely dose the patient. So in, in practice, uh, I know it can be a challenge sometimes uh, adhering to these guidelines. I think the message here is, is, is not so much that you have to do as frequent as monitoring as we did in the trials, but this is not giving somebody a brute nib and telling them to come back in a month and we'll check your blood counts and see how you're doing. Uh, so it's an investment. I, I describe it to my patients as an investment for four or five weeks to make sure that, uh, that it, things are safe and you can get on an effective dose. And thereafter, I must say, the tolerability has been uh, superb. Um, really, in terms of other significant side effects, uh, including side effects that may affect quality of life, they've been very, very, very few. So uh, really a, a very useful, very effective agent uh, for our patients and one which they can tolerate even if they stay on it longer term. Of course, some patients uh, will progress on this drug as well, and certainly the patients that have shuttled through these various trials, because that's generally where they come from. Uh, they come from our, our abrutinib and idalisib trials, and then we, when they progress, we have this trial available, and they went on that, uh, and, uh, but some still progress. Now, I, I should mention that that last trial, um, patients who had received ibrutinib and idalisib, what we did is we screened each and every patient uh, prior to enrollment with a PET scan, and we required biopsies if the F SUV was elevated, for example, to really try to exclude patients with uh, Richter's transformation or uh, Hodgkin's transformation in, in rare cases, because we know that the drug venetoclax isn't particularly effective for uh, transformed disease. So a little rigor, more rigorous screening, uh, certainly something we didn't apply in any of the earlier trials, and we didn't do routinely, for example, in the idelisib or, or brutinib uh, trials. So I think we were, in some ways, selecting out those patients early on when we started treating them with these agents, and that accounts at least in part for why you see this largely as an early event. So an interesting study was recently published in Blood uh, <clears throat> from the Australian group where they looked at their experience in three of the early phase clinical trials with venetoclax and asked the question of, number one, how do uh, patients do after they progress, and what are some of the features that may predict progression? Uh, so in the upper left here, you could see uh, those who progressed. Uh, the ones who did the best over all the way to the left are those who had Hodgkin's uh, as, a, as a progression event. Uh, and those <clears throat> in the, the middle are the uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients, uh, uh, 14 patients who had a Richter's transformation. In the blue, there are eight patients who uh, progressed with uh, just CLL or SLL. Uh, those who uh, achieved a CR, uh, their best response on venetoclax uh, tended to have less chance of progression than those who didn't respond at all. So the non-responders uh, uh, did, uh, did worse as expected. Those who entered uh, who were fludarabine refractory, shown on the bottom left there, um, <clears throat> those patients uh, did worse uh, than those who were not fludarabine refractory, so perhaps those who were more exposed to uh, traditional chemotherapy or chemoimmunotherapy. And on the right, uh, it compares complex karyotype with non-complex karyotype. Again, complex karyotype being a bad actor and uh, uh, really suggesting that those patients are at higher risk of progression 
if they were on uh, previously, if they were treated with venetoclax. And this is another way of uh, looking at that. Interestingly, if you look at the non-fludarabine refractory patients who receive venetoclax, complex karyotype no longer distinguished between those uh, likely to progress and those not. <clears throat> Here's the outcomes of the individual patients after progression. The top three patients are those Hodgkin's patients. One had a transplant, and all continued on chemotherapy of some sort, as one might expect, none died. If you look at the, uh, the bottom portion there, the black uh, circles uh, represent individual uh, deaths. Uh, not surprisingly, the majority of patients with a Richter's transformation uh, died of their progression. We'll hear more about that uh, disease uh, in the next talk. And again, those with progressive CLL tended to not do well either, but I think that's the, a selection of patients who had had a lot of prior therapy uh, over the course of their uh, disease. So, uh, so we have some information now what to expect from this group, but we're hoping that we won't see patients like that uh, in the future, patients who have been heavily pretreated with chemoimmunotherapy drugs uh, damaging their DNA, uh, damaging their normal <coughs> uh, hematopoietic uh, reservoir, for example. And so, of course, there have been uh, uh, several um, upfront trials with these agents in, in, in the US, the North American Cooperative Group, completed randomized trials, for example, of FCR versus abrutinib rituximab, and for older patients, BR versus abrutinib rituximab versus abrutinib, and were eagerly awaiting uh, the results of those trials. But in the meantime, other trials have been planned, and uh, this is one of them. This is the uh, ECOG trial for younger patients uh, that will compare ibrutinib and ibinutuzumab uh, to ibrutinib, obinutuzumab, and venetoclax. Uh, so sort of a debulking uh, approach initially with uh, ibrutinib and obinutuzumab, adding in venetoclax uh, a little bit later, a few months later, to hopefully mitigate the risk of tumor lysis. Uh, and then in this trial, uh, in the experimental three-drug arm, all therapy stops after 18 months. So it's a time-limited trial. And I think the future of treatment with CLL, certainly in the upfront setting, will be to look at combinations uh, and try to understand if we can use these drugs in a time-limited manner. <clears throat> so I list here just uh, several other uh, ongoing trials that use combinations of these drugs. The, the first is uh, shown here is from the German CLL study group. Uh, Dr. Halleck, I'm sure, is quite familiar with this. This is the, what I refer to as the opus. Uh, I think the only, uh, the only arm missing here that I could figure out might be ibrutinib venetoclax rituximab. But uh, I think uh, these sorts of trials will be very interesting to look at outcomes, to look at tolerability, and to look at the various ways people are thinking about how we can give therapy in a time-limited manner. Uh, now, will this be necessary in all of our patients? I don't think so. Uh, remember, we often forget that the average CLL patient is over 70, and the average CLL patient who starts therapy is in their mid-70s, not the patients I just showed you. Um, and I think we may very well end up being able to treat the average CLL patient, whether continuously or intermittently, uh, for the rest of their natural lives. And I think the challenge is to figure out how we can cure uh, the younger patients with CLL. Thank you very much. <laughs>